Well, good morning. Good morning. On this Palm Sunday, it's good to see you and uh, everybody here. Um, we're very excited about uh, th this next week, and I hope that you are as well as we prepare for uh, prepare for Easter. <clears throat> for our guests, I've been doing a series this month. Uh, Andy started a couple weeks ago, and then I picked up last Sunday and today, and then the Sunday after Easter will finish it up about my life and God's light. And you just heard the scripture read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, where Jesus said to his disciples, you're the light of the world. You don't take a light and hide it. You know, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And all those things that he said to them about being light. So we're going to kind of go for a little bit farther today <clears throat> with that and talk about you and me and how, how we do that and, and who we are supposed to be uh, in this world as believers. Um, I hope that you last, uh, and I encourage you last Sunday, if you were able to contact the person who led you to Christ, to go back and find that man, that woman, whoever it might be, make a phone call, send a text, um, a letter, whatever it might be that, that you can use to communicate with them and just say thank you for being God's light in my life. And, uh, and uh, some people came up to me, I had a couple come up to me and, um, and say, hey, you're the guy. And I didn't even know it. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. That's one of the great things about, about walking with the Lord. We all have some things that we love to tell others about, don't we? Things in your life, you know, we want to tell others about. You buy that brand new car and you want to show it off and you want to tell people all about it. Ask a grandma about her grandkids <clears throat> if you have the time. And um, <laughs> ask a hunter or a, or a fisherman about their biggest kill or their biggest catch. Ask a foodie like Andy what he cooked for dinner last night. And you don't have to ask him if you're one of his friends on Facebook. You'll see it, all right? <clears throat> no, he likes to take pictures. Ask a, a sports fan about their favorite team. Uh, some of you love to tell others uh, in our community about about your church, and I'm so glad that you do. So in your notes, you have a little place that says, fill in, the, fill in this blank. I, I love to tell people about. What is it that you're passionate about, that you love to tell people about, um, and uh, have them hear about something that really is really important to you? Uh, so today in our, our series, My Life, God's Light, we're talking about telling others about Jesus and how to know him as Savior. Uh, I shared with you last Sunday my personal story of how as a 10-year-old boy, I heard the gospel and understood it. I told you, I said, maybe I had heard it before that, but I remember when I heard it and it clicked. You know what I mean by it clicked? You didn't hear a click, but all of a sudden you knew this is for me. This is what I need to do. And I believed on that day as in Christ as my Savior. And every Christian... <clears throat> Every person who has accepted Jesus has, has a story. And that story is not hard to tell. I can't tell. Uh, some of you, I can tell your story because I've heard it. You've shared it with me. And so I can tell your story. But you know what? I can't tell it as well as you can. I can't. And you're telling your story to your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers, whoever it might be. If I tell your story to them, it doesn't have the impact that it has when you tell your story. And that story is not hard to tell if it's your story. I can't tell you um, how to do it, and, and, and so I can give you some ideas. But your story of how Jesus became your Savior needs to be told, and it needs to be heard by your friends and your neighbors and your acquaintances and coworkers, teammates, uh, classmates, whoever it might be. But for most of us in this room, and most of us in this room, I'm going to guess and say, are already Christians. <clears throat> I won't assume that, but I'm, I'm guessing that. For most of us in this room, sharing the gospel with unbelievers is probably the number one hardest thing to do, isn't it? That Jesus has commanded us to do. Uh, we would much rather do hands-on things. Uh, we, we would much rather do social justice deeds of kindness than verbally tell someone else about the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Isn't that strange? When I, when we'll tell about everything else that goes on in our lives. You know, people have asked me the last week or so, how was your vacation? 
I, mean, I love to tell you about my vacation. I told you last Sunday some things. And if you ask me about it, I'll tell you again. I mean, it was great. We love to tell about the things that are very important to us, most even very personal things, you know. You, you know that guy? Hey, let me show you my scar from my surgery. You know, you, or, maybe you are that guy. <laughs> Steve, you haven't done that, have you? Steve's got a knee replacement. and uh... Yes, you have. <laughs> <clears throat> but I said last week, you know, Jesus left us with one job, didn't he? With the most important thing we could ever share and... By and large, most Christians, we keep it to ourselves. Now, something that's very personal to me, and I love to tell people about it, embarrasses her sometimes. But I love to tell people how I fell in love with Gail. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I hope. If you say no, I ain't telling nobody that. <laughs> well, I hope you're not in love with Gail. But <clears throat> Except I met Leroy back here, and Leroy's wife's name is Gail, so... And I've told this story here before, and I'm just going to run through it real quick. It's easy to tell, and it's easy to tell for four reasons. Reason number one, I can't believe she fell in love with me. I'm still in awe, and I tell her that. Number two, I love to tell how I fell in love with her because I won. All those other guys are losers. I won. I got the girl of my dreams. Third reason, my life is so much better with her than it would have ever been without her. Amen, Amen fellas? Amen. Or you can say, oh, me, if that's what you want, but that's okay. My life is with her. Oh, yeah. And number four, I still love her. This June will be married 42 years. I still love her even more than I did then. So I love to tell that story. It's, it's all good for me. It's not, I don't know about her. I don't know if she got up here right now, she'd say the same things, but I will say the same things. Now, why should we tell others about our relationship with Jesus? And I would say the same four reasons, really. Let me give you some scriptures to go along with those reasons. Number one, I can't believe he loved me enough to die for me. Nobody else has ever done that for me. I mean, personally, I know some people have died on the battlefield for my liberty, for my freedom. But I mean, personally, nobody else that I know of has loved me enough to die for me. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he would give up his life for another. The book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, for rarely will someone die for a just person, for a good person, for someone who deserves it. Rarely will somebody do that. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But here's what God did. God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, in other words, Paul's saying we don't deserve it. We're not just when Jesus died for us. God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's amazing. I can't believe that he loved me that much. Number two, I win. I get forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of this new relationship that I have in Jesus Christ, this new life. Romans 8, verses 30, verse 37, in all these things, he's writing to Christians, in all these things, and he goes through a list of all kinds of bad things that could happen in life. And all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. Colossians 1.14, in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I win. Don't you? My sins are forgiven. Number three, the life he gives me now is rich and full. I'm not waiting so much for heaven, although I'm looking forward to it. But, I, you know, and, and, you know, heaven's a... I, I think it's wonderful that we as Christians are promised everlasting life in heaven, aren't you? And I'm looking forward to that. I don't necessarily want to go there right now. How about you? I mean, that would be scary, wouldn't it? Boom, I just fall right over on the floor and Rick's gone to heaven. He shouldn't have said that. And, um, 
I'm looking for, but what about this life that I live now? And again, I became a Christian when I was 10, and I'm 63 now, so for almost 53 years, it'll be this summer that I trusted Christ. He has made in these 53 years my life fuller and richer than it could have ever possibly been before. John 10.10, Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it in abundance. You know what abundance is? Abundance is when you open up the, the cabinet in the morning like I do to pull out my box of Cheerios for breakfast. And not only is there one box of Cheerios, there's two. Abundance, more than I, could, I, I need. Number four, I love him now more than I did when we first met because of how he has loved me since I believed. He has never stopped loving me. It's not that he just loved me when he died on the cross for me. He continues to love me because I'm part of his family. He continues to love me because he, he and I have this relationship now. We're reconciled. He's brought me to God. John wrote in 1 John 3, 1, look at how he says, hey, check this out. I like the, the way the King James Version says it. I like that word, behold, it says. Don't you like that? We don't say that much these days. Look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called, we who did not deserve it, that we should be called God's children. And we are, he said. Isn't this great? So what's the difference? Why is it easier to tell someone, or look at your, your notes maybe, if you wrote that down, filled in that blank, or you thought what, what you would. Why is it easier to tell someone about something really special to me? Why is it easier for me to tell you, or tell, tell a total stranger, why I love my wife? Why is that easier than for me to tell, or you to tell about the most special person in all the universe? Why is that? And you, you know the answers. And if I asked for some answers, you could give them back. Well, they might reject me. They might say, I don't want to hear that anymore. And, and they might not want to, you know, I, I don't want to be around you anymore. I had a lady did that to me one time. I was, I was asked to go to her home and, and sit down with her little girl who had gotten in trouble at school. Like, you know, like I had to fix. Oh, Pastor, will you go and talk to, and, and this lady had never been to church her little girl, however, was coming to our church with friends. And so I sat down in the home and, and uh, talked to the little girl about getting in trouble and why, you know, why we need to obey the teacher and do what we're told. And then I turned to the mom and, and I started talking about Jesus because I knew she wasn't a believer. And I got told about Jesus and told about him coming and living this life that he lived and then dying on the cross. And then when I got to the part about the resurrection she looked at me she says I don't want to hear anymore stop she told me so we don't sometimes well that's what that, well, that would happen to me and I just couldn't handle that hey hey guess what church I, I don't know how many zillions of times I've said this to you it's not about me they might reject me it's not about me all right Jesus said, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me, he said. They might be offended. The gospel is offensive, Paul said. Why is the cross offensive? Because it tells people, you can't get to God on your own. You can't be good enough to get there. And people go, oh, yes, I can, watch me. And the Bible says, the gospel says, no, there was only one good enough. Might be offended. And, and we say, well, it's too hard to do that, to witness, because some people have a dis distorted view of God because of what professing, professing Christians do and have done. And that's true. And so they don't want to hear about God because they've known Christians. And that says one thing. If we say, I have these excuses, again, that says this, this is all about me and not about God and not about caring for someone's eternal destiny. If we use those excuses or any excuse. <coughs> So I ask you this question. Would God command us to do something that without his help was impossible? Would he do that? And the answer is, of course, of course he would. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that he's given us his power to be 
witnesses. Acts 1.8, read that with me. Let's say it together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, some of you are saying, good, that leaves me out because I've never been to any of those places. Oh, yeah, you have. What's the last one? The ends of the earth. Guess where we are on the Outer Banks? Huh? You don't think so? You try walking 400 yards that way. The word in that verse for power is the source of our word dynamite. And it means, does it mean, I've heard people say it means explosive. It means simply ability is what that word means. God has given us the ability, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, to be his witnesses, the ability. So we can't say, I, I'm just unprepared. I don't know anything. It's not about you. It's about the ability that he's put in you. Has he put that ability in me? Do you know Jesus as Savior? Yes, then the Holy Spirit resides in you and you have the ability to tell your story, to tell his story. To be his witnesses. What's a witness? A witness is someone who has seen, heard, or experienced something and tells about it. You ever had to be a witness in a courtroom in, a, in a, some kind of a case? What, what do they ask you to do? Tell us what you saw. Tell us what you heard. They don't want secondhand information because secondhand information means I am not a witness. But we've all experienced Christ and we have something to tell. And every Christian has experienced the gospel of Christ. So in and of ourselves, we're right. I can't do that. In and of yourselves, you're absolutely right. You cannot. In and of your own ability, we can't. And we won't witness about the gospel. And Jesus knew that. So, Acts 1.8 tells us, he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God. I'm going I'm to empower you to do this. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, you, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian very long, you're familiar with that, those two verses. But Jesus starts out by saying, all authority has been given to me. All power has been given to me, meaning he received it from his father, the sovereign of the universe. And with that authority, he's commanded us to make disciples of all the nations. All authority has been given to me from the father. And he gives us that authority. But we can find those excuses for not sharing the gospel. Listen, I'm talking to Christian people here right now. We can even cloak them in theology, the excuses. For example, have you ever heard this or said this? But I don't have the gift of evangelism. Gift. Some people are given the amazing ability by God to spread the gospel. I think Billy Graham had an amazing ability, didn't he, to spread the gospel. And some people, in, in, even in our churches, have the amazing ability to spread the gospel. They just say that's what makes them tick. And by example, maybe they teach and they lead the church to lead people to faith in Christ. Ephesians 4.11 says that Christ personally gave some of these people to the church to be evangelists, those who share the gospel. The word evangelist, by the way, the word Greek word for gospel is from the same word as evangelism. Euangelion is the Greek word, and it's from the same word. So an evangelist is a gospelizer, right? Someone who shares the gospel. The gifts in Romans 12 are for serving, for doing ministry among the church. And, and many of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, there's two lists of gifts in the, in the New Testament, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. And the ones in 1 Corinthians 12, many of them were sign gifts. They were miraculous abilities with the purpose of demonstrating the gospel of Jesus as the real deal. But let me ask you a question. Guess, guess what gift isn't mentioned in either of those lists? I read them through a bunch of times to make sure I wasn't confused. There is no gift of evangelism in either one of those lists. 
maybe there isn't such a gift. Why not? Why might there, by the way, why might there not be a gift of evangelism if evangelism, but Rick, you're saying evangelism, sharing our faith is such an important thing. It's the one job he gave us to do, but why is it maybe that there's not such a gift if it's such an important thing? And the answer to that, I guess, might be because we might use it as an excuse not to witness because we might say, but I don't have that gift. We might point to someone with that gift and say, you know what, so-and-so in my church has the gift of evangelism. My pastor has the gift of evangelism, so I'll let him, I'll let her tell the world about Jesus. And what I'll do is I'll give and I'll serve and I'll be kind and I'll teach and I'll lead, which are all gifts of the Spirit. I'll do those things, but I'm exempt from having to share the gospel because I don't have that gift. There's something faulty with that reasoning. So you're right, maybe you don't have the gift of evangelism. I I don't. But I don't have the gift of mercy, which is one of those gifts. All the Nags Head Church people say amen. Rick doesn't. I don't have the gift of mercy. Yet, let me ask you, we just went through the Beatitudes. Am I supposed to be merciful? Hmm. I may not have the gift of giving. That's one of the gifts in Romans 12. Am I supposed to give? I may not have the gift of wisdom. That's one of the gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. But am I supposed to be wise? Yeah, in fact, in James, James says, look, if you lack wisdom, just ask God for it and he'll give it to you. There's no excuse for not being wise. So if I don't have the gift of evangelism, am I supposed to share the gospel anyway? You see? We know the answer. Of course I am. The wrong question this morning is, do I have the gift of evangelism? The right question is, am I a Christian? Because if I am, I'm supposed to share. I'm supposed to tell. If I'm a Christian, I've been commissioned by Christ to tell others about Jesus. Okay, here's a second excuse. I hear this more than the other one, maybe. Okay, well, I don't tell the gospel with my words because I choose to share the gospel by my example, by my good deeds, by my being kind, and by my being generous. Some of you just said, man, you just nailed me. For sure, if the church wants to create a hunger and thirst in others and lead them to Christ, it can start with the things that we do. Those acts of kindness. Jesus talked about giving people a drink of water in his name. But that water that you might give to someone else, that casserole you might cook, that bag of supplies, provide a a foster child on his or her first day in foster care. That's one of our things that we do, outreach missions that we do here. None of those things have within them the message of salvation. Do they? No. But what, well, why do we do those things? Well, one thing, one reason is because they can open doors. They earn us by doing acts of kindness and doing things for others and providing a place for the homeless to to sleep and be fed and, and so many other things that we do here. They earn us the right, if you will, to be heard. They can soften hearts. They can arouse curiosity about, why did you do that for me? They prepare the soil, if you will. But please get this. Please hear me. Because there's such a strong movement amongst Christianity today to say we don't have to tell, we just need to shine our light. We just need to do. No one will be in heaven simply because we were nice to them. Did you hear that? They must hear the message of Christ. They got to hear it. They got to hear the gospel. Why do you say that? Because the Bible says it, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from what is heard. 
Not what is felt. Not that full stomach that we gave them from that meal that we provided. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. And the, the word message there. Well, yeah, but aren't we giving messages when we give bottles of water out on the beach to people and all the things, different things that we do. The word message is from the Greek word rhema, which means what you speak or what is spoken. What is the message? What is the spoken word about Christ? It's the gospel, isn't it? And just before that, in verse 14, Paul wrote this, and how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And the answer, of course, is they can't. Now, I know some of you are going, bingo, it says a preacher. Rick, that's you. No. Preachers there simply mean someone who proclaims, someone who speaks the gospel. That's you when you do. It isn't the guy behind the pulpit, or in our case, the cocktail table at church. It's anybody who shares the word of God, the gospel with people. Jesus taught the disciples this principle in a parable. We know it as the, the parable of the soils in, in Luke chapter 8 is one of the places it's, it's uh, given. And, and uh, what is a parable? A parable is a fictional story with a spiritual truth or application. There's a picture up of, of, uh, of what Jesus was talking there about a sower went forth to sow. A farmer was planting seed in his field. He would reach in his bag and he'd just scatter the seed. They didn't have farm equipment like we have today. And Jesus, in telling this parable, says, and some of the seed that he scattered fell on hard, packed, unplowed ground, fell on the wayside, it fell on the pathway, if you will, on the road. Burns me up when I go out my front yard and I sow grass seed. And I have a machine, a little push thing to do that scatter. But buddy, I hate to see that seed on my sidewalk or my driveway. Why? Because I know if I leave it there, it's just there for the birds to eat. It's not going to grow any seed there. And he said some of the seed fell on stony ground. There, was, there is some soil, but it's rocky like what place I was up in the mountains a week before last. Stony ground. And because it was stony ground, the roots could not grow down deep. He said, some of the seed landed among the thorns and the weeds that choked it off, blocked the sun, took the nutrition from the soil so that it couldn't grow. And some seed, the fourth kind of seed, or the fourth kind of soil, excuse me, fell on good, rich, plowed, fertilized soil. As we were driving through the countryside, we, uh, we were on vacation, we we're up in farm country and cows and sheep and all that, driving through the countryside where they had, they're, they're plowing fields and, and Gail says, oh, what is that smell? And I, I should have said, that's the smell of sweet corn in July. Some fell on the good, rich, plowed soil where it could grow and produce fruit. Jesus made it very clear in this story, and he said these words, that the seed in this story, he said, is the word of God. So hear me, seed is not kindness. Seed is not giving food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothing to the naked. That's not seed. But those things might help plow the soil. Those things might water seed that's already been planted. But hear me, church, please hear me. We cannot allow those kinds of things, as wonderful as they are, we cannot allow them to become substitutes for the gospel. They're not. But there, do, there has to be seed to produce the crop. One of the greatest things about, one of the things that we do here that we've been doing for Wow, since I think the second year they started it, back in about 94, we do Operation Christmas Child. We do the shoe boxes with Samaritan's Purse um, every November. And we fill shoe boxes with toys and toothbrushes and soap. And, 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 and so in Samaritan's Purse 
takes those shoe boxes and goes to mostly to other countries and presents them to children. And with each shoe box is a presentation of the gospel. The boxes are distributed by local churches in those countries. Here's the boxes. You churches give these to the kids in your community, in your town, in your village. Invite those children to come to your church. Invite their parents. And they share the gospel through those shoe boxes. And, and I was talking the other day with Alex McFarland. Alex has a great connection with um, the Billy Graham Association. So he's well aware of all these kinds of things. And he said to me, Rick, we were talking about this. And he said, Rick, do you know right now where the greatest impact of those shoes, shoe boxes is being felt and being made in the world? He said, in Iran. In Iran, those shoe boxes are leading people to Jesus Christ as they're being presented by the Christians in that country and the gospel's being shared through those things. Isn't that awesome? But really, does it take a Christian to do good things for other people? Don't people who are not Christians do good things for other people? So let's not think that the good things are the deal. There are lots of benevolent organizations that are not gospel-oriented. It takes the Word of God to give what every man, woman, and child needs. Every man, every woman, every child needs a relationship, a reconciliation with God through Christ. It takes the gospel to do that. So, let me wrap up this morning by giving you a challenge. Nags Head Church. I'm calling it the Easter Challenge. Right? Easter's next Sunday. Have you heard that yet? Seven days to Easter. If you look on our, go on our website, it's got a countdown. It counts down to the seconds when Easter is. To remind us, next Sunday, Easter gives us perhaps the, the greatest, the one best opportunity as a church to share the gospel and extend an invitation to more folks than any other Sunday of the year doesn't it? And you know, if you were here last year, we had Nags Head Church, and we're not a big church and not in a big community, but we totaled, totaled it all up, Stephen. We had a thousand people here hearing the gospel last Easter. That's why we've added another service next Sunday at 7.30. We just kind of do another one to make room. And we don't know how many will be here next Sunday. Jesus may come before that. But we've added another service, as I said. We want to have room. And, and so I want, I, want to, I want to challenge you to make the most of Easter Sunday for the Lord. Let me suggest four things you can do. Number one, and again, you've heard this already today from Tom. Invite your unchurched friends, your neighbors, acquaintances, your classmate, the mechanic, who changes your oil, the barista at your favorite coffee shop, the cashier at your bank, your neighbor who recently went through a divorce or lost a spouse and is alone, your kids' friends, parents that you see at birthday parties and such. And let them know, by the way, those kids' friends, those friends' kids' parents, let them know what an incredible kids ministry we have here let the guy or the gal that you play pickleball with we got a bunch of picklers here in this room let them know invite them uh, your, your kids ball coach your kids are playing baseball or soccer or whatever they're playing right now and we have these cards Tom mentioned them they look like this they're not big I've got a few in my pocket. And we have these cards, business card size, and, and they're just invitation cards. And say, hey, you know what? I would love for you to come be my guest at Nags Head Church next Easter Sunday, next week. And on, on the front, it tells when the services are. And on the back, it, it just gives a little bit of internet information about Nags Head Church so they can look us up if they want to. And to invite them to come. Have the cards. Use the cards. I, I don't want to see any cards left next Sunday morning. Number two, you invite them 
and by the way, you say, well, I'll invite one. Well, you're probably going to have to invite more than one to get somebody to come. That's just the way it is. But invite them, and when they show up, meet them here and sit with them. Invite them to come to a specific service. Which one do you attend? That's the one you want to invite them to. So you can sit with them. Explain to them before they come in what a service at Nagstead Church is like because chances are it's different from what they're used to. Amen? Yeah. And it's different for a reason. But let them know we don't handle snakes. All right? <laughs> let them know what it's like. Then number three, and maybe this is the most important one. Invite them to go out to eat breakfast or brunch or lunch with you or invite them to join you for lunch at home after church. And after church, I want, I want let's go out to eat. And second most important to that one is, and, and it, lunch is on me. I'll buy you lunch. And at the meal, just ask the question, hey, what did you think? Open up the conversation. And it may open up a conversation that before you leave that restaurant or before you leave that home, that dining room in your house, it may end up with eternal results. Huh? Number four, pray for those you invite. Pray that they'll accept your invitation. Pray that they'll listen to the gospel. Pray that the gospel changes their lives forever. And I promise you, I promise you that we won't do anything to embarrass them. We have a lot of guests here today. You're not wearing any kind of a sticker that says visitor. You know, we haven't made you stand up and introduce yourself. You know why? First time guests, they'd rather crawl in a hole you know, underneath their chair than do that. We're not going to do that to anybody. I promise we won't do that. I promise, though, that they'll hear next Sunday. I promise they'll hear the story of the empty tomb and what it can mean to their lives and their forever. And we'll come back after Easter. Those of us will be here the next Sunday, the 28th, and personally talk about how to personally explain the gospel. All right, Easter challenge. I asked this question as we finished up last Sunday. I'll ask it again today. So who's your one? Who's the one you're going to bring? Who's the one you're really praying for? So let's pray. Would you bow with me in prayer? While your heads are bowed, let me ask you, Nag said church. This is for our church folks. Who among us that Nag said church will say, Rick, I will accept the challenge. Those four things that you just said, I accept the challenge. Would you raise your hand? Well, we need more than that. I accept the challenge. And let me ask, maybe you're here today. Thank you, put your hands down. Uh, and maybe you're here today, and maybe this is your first time or maybe you've been a bunch of times and you've heard because in this message I, I shared the gospel how to know Jesus Christ as Savior and maybe you're here today and you would say I, Pastor I've never done that never in my life And I sure would like to know that I have everlasting life. I sure would like to know that my sins are all forgiven. I want to invite you right now to receive Jesus as your Savior. And again, nobody's looking around but God and me. I would like to just pray for you. Not that that's going to make you a Christian. It doesn't. That's something that has to happen within your own heart between you and God, as you ask him, as you express it to him, I want Jesus, I want you to be my savior. Forgive my sins and give me everlasting life. But maybe you're here today and say, Rick, I've never done that, but I would like you to pray for me that God will make that plain to me and help me understand that so that I can take that step. 
Is there anybody at all like that? Just slip your hand up. I'm looking around so I can pray. I won't call your name out. I won't come down to your seat and tap you on the shoulder. Anybody at all? Our pastors are going to be standing here, a couple of us, after the after we're finished this morning. And if you would like to come and talk with us about that, just one-on-one, we'll be here for that. Father in heaven, I pray that you will help those of us who are your children, who are members of your family, to be the light of the world. Which means not only doing, but it means telling. Because the gospel has to be heard to be believed. So help us to do that one job you've left us with. Help us, Father, as we invite this week, if we haven't already, invite folks that we know to come on Easter and they'll get to hear the gospel. No greater privilege we have than to share with somebody else what has been shared with us. So would you bless as we do. In Christ's name I pray.